How many of you have been feeling in a couple of weeks that you've been in a battle? Yeah. Well, I want to confirm this. I want you to turn to somebody and say, friend, friend. you in a battle. You in a battle. Jesus Christ said, in this world you will have what? Yes, you will have trouble. Thank you. In this world you will have trouble. And there's trouble that comes from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Things that are tragic accidents, like what happened with your friend. That's the trouble in the world. Things that uh, you bring upon yourself. The doctor says, you know, your, your number says this, 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 so you must live on broccoli and oatmeal. Oh, and you uh, decide to make some choices otherwise. That's the trouble that you bring upon yourself. Then there's a third trouble in the world. And that's the trouble that comes from the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. For the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about how to combat the devil. Amen. Because we have an enemy. That's right. That's right. He is real, and his intent is to actively work against you. And every day, his goal is to keep you from experiencing the victory that is yours in Christ. That's right. Now listen, he can't destroy you, but he can distract you, yes. discourage you, divide you yes. from others, and deter you from experiencing what is rightfully yours as a child of God. He wants you miserable and living below the benefits that Christ has won for you. But don't be afraid. The Holy Spirit has got your back. Amen. You see, you got peoples. You got the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence of God. But you are a soldier in a spiritual battle. And the enemy wants you to be blind to the weapons that the Lord has provided for you. But we're in a series to tell you, to educate you about the armor of God. Amen. Amen. And these are the weapons that the Lord has provided for you. Because the Lord wants you to wake up, open your eyes, and not only fight the enemy, he wants you to defeat the enemy. So how are we going to defeat the devil? Well, we're going to exercise our spiritual muscles. That's one of them, but we got an arsenal. We're going to be going through each arsenal every week. Now, I want you to know this. Don't think that your life is going to be okay if you don't engage the enemy. Let me tell you something. He is engaging you. Regardless. The issue isn't whether you, you won't fight. The fight is upon you. The fight is upon you. The bully is coming for you. Amen. You know how they say at 3 o'clock I'll see you after school? <laughs> That's the devil. Amen. So you can run and hide in the closet all you want, but at 3 o'clock somebody's waiting for you. you know? Well, that's the devil. Well, the enemy wants you to know at 3 o'clock he's there, but God wants you to know that at 2.55 he's there. Exactly. So war is upon us, whether we want to engage it in it or not. And if you don't fight, the devil will win. Mm, that's right. That's right. And what does it look like when the devil wins in our lives? Abandoned or conflicted relationships. Disregarded purity, drifting away from integrity, intense cravings, appetites out of control, no resistance to destructive tendencies, destructive people, destructive thinking. When we don't fight, the devil goes unchecked and he will wreak havoc in our lives. And his ultimate goal is to stop you from achieving the purposes of God. That's why he worked so hard to beat you down with discouragement. And he lies to you about 
about who God is. He wants you to doubt the Lord's goodness. He loves to accuse you and shame you and put guilt on you, always telling you that you're not good enough or you're a failure. He wants, to think, uh, he wants you to think that you're alone, God doesn't hear, he doesn't care, and he's not going to answer when you call upon him. If you ignore what the devil is trying to do to you, he's going to devastate your mind, your body, and your soul. And he's going to target all your relationships for division and discord. And he wants you to run in fear. Either way, he wants your spiritual fire to burn low. He wants you to become disinterested in the activities and the people of God. And when he, got you, he, when he gets you just where he wants you, there is nothing worse than a defeated believer. So I think I've laid out the case. I've told you this uh, short little story before. It's an uh, allegory. But it's always so apt. And it's this issue of discouragement. All of us who are in a battle right now, or you were in a battle, or believe me, the enemy's getting ready to bring a battle, one of the biggest weapons he has is discouragement. I'm going to read to you uh, something I've read to you before. But it's so apt. The devil announced a going out of business sale, which of course we know doesn't really mean he's going out of business. And he laid out all the tools of his trade with price tags for anyone to purchase. There was hatred and jealousy and envy and greed and more, a nasty bunch of devices, all for a price. And some of the tools were pretty complicated. But one was surprisingly simple. It was just a simple little wedge that looked a lot like a, a, a doorstop. It was very worn and scratched and scuffed. And it was far more expensive than any of the other high-tech tools. And someone asked, well, what's this one? And the devil replied, that's discouragement. Well, why is it so expensive? Because, said the devil, it is more useful to me than any of the others. Most people can see the other tools coming, and they stop me. But with discouragement, I sneak up on them a little at a time, and I slowly pry them open and get inside where I can use my other tools. And when someone gets discouraged, they make excuses, and I got them. Or they cheat, and I got them. Or they get jealous of other success, and I got them. Or they just completely quit, and I got them. That's why it's so worn, you see. I use it with nearly everybody because few people know that it belongs to me. When you no longer want to fight for peace or passion in your marriage, you're discouraged. When you no longer believe your child can be rescued or restored, you're discouraged. When you no longer hope for healing in your body, you're discouraged. When, when you no longer see any path to be free of your addictions, you're discouraged. When you just want to quit, I give up. I give up. I, I'm done. Whatever it is, when you want to quit, you're discouraged. When you stop asking or seeking God's help, you're what? Discouraged. When you don't care anymore, and you don't want to fight anymore, you're being attacked with a weapon of discouragement. I'm being attacked. I recognize it. You know, you go into a state of shock and you start feeling an attack. You're like, what? Wait, whoa. And then your spiritual senses start to kick in. Now, you know with every blessing the Lord sends your way, there's a stress that comes along with it from the end. Now, I received a blessing about three weeks ago. I was hired as a substitute teacher. That's a blessing. Everybody praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And with every blessing, the enemy sends a stress. 
stress it every single time. Your beautiful babies, they were born, but there was a stress, right? Yeah. Every single time. So, I've been working for as a substitute teacher, and it's been one of the most challenging careers I have ever embarked upon. I am challenged mentally, emotionally, and physically every single day I go into the school. Last week topped the cake. I, we started out so well, we were in a little group discussion. It was a fifth grade class. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well. Yes, and it was only 12 of them. Oh. And, uh, but there was, uh, it was a special ed class. And what happens in special ed is that the children have short, extremely short attention spans. And um, when their focus goes away from them, they become fidgety and they start to lose attention and focus. And when, you, when they start to lose attention and focus, they start to do this. They start to aggravate each other, poke at each other, throw things at each other, not pay attention. So I had them in group, and they were going well. Then I had Lala. Her name was Lala. Pretty name. Oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Lala had just finished sharing. Uh, I asked them all, what's a special thing about you uh, that nobody knows? And they were all like so happy to share their special thing. And Lala shared about her two puppies. One was named Butter. No, one was a cat. One was named Butter, and the other one was named Fluffy. And she was just going on and on and on. And we were all like, oh, that's great. So then we moved on around the circle. But once you take your attention off Lala, uh -huh. Lala loses her focus because she can't focus on other people. Not right now. She doesn't have the maturity and the control to do it right now. I didn't know at my level um, how severe her issue was. So we're going around the room, and then Lala gets up, and she goes to, uh, she's distracted now, so she goes to another part of the room. I encourage her, come back in the circle. Um, while still trying to maintain control within the circle. Then another little girl gets up. Her name is Lene. We've already discussed Lene's specialties, and she no longer is interested in hearing the rest of the group. So she gets up and she goes to where Lala is at. And the two of them decide to start to fight each other. And I'm trying to maintain control of the group, and I see that they are starting to to talk sharply, and then one of them picks up something and throws it at the other and hits, hits Lala in the face. I immediately run over there. There's a power in the room, but he's a male power, and these are two little girls. That's an issue. A male power cannot get involved with a little girl. So he's trying to corral the rest of the room while a fight breaks off him in this corner with Lala and Lene. So I get between Lala and Lene, and Lala is determined to kill Lene. So I'm holding Lala back, and she is kicking me. She is screaming at me. She is clawing at me. Lene is behind me, holding on for dear life to my waist. I'm trying to hold this child on. Security is being called. And I, I'm just, I'm being battled by this little 10-year-old. And, and, and she is furious. I don't know if you've seen a person in a psychotic rage. I can only put it to that. And her strength. This was the strength of a man fighting me, not the strength of a little girl. I could not hold her back. She was beating me to death, trying to get to a man. So finally, safety breaks in and pulls Lala away. I moved Lana. Lane over to the corner where the other children are cowering with the power, and they pull Lala out of the room. And we are all like, oh my God, what just happened? Lala breaks free from safety. <laughs> and she runs all around the school trying to find an exit staircase she can come up and get back in the room to get back at Lene. She breaks 
back into the room. I look, she's storming in the room, determined to get Lene. We all surround Lene and block Lene because Mama's gonna kill her. This is a 10 year old child. And we're like, where the heck does safety go? And then safety comes in and they drag her out again. But I forgot to mention, when she breaks away from safety, we didn't know she had broken away from safety, public safety. The school went on lockdown because they couldn't find Lala. Lala is raging around because, of course, they're trying to block her from getting back into the class to kill the little girl. She breaks away from safety and runs down their stairwell so they don't know where Lala is. So they're afraid. Announcement comes on. Soft lockdown. Everybody shelter in place. We're terrified of a 10 year old running around the school rampaging, determined to kill another 10 year old. Oh my God. And then when she breaks back into the room, I don't know how she got back in the room. I, uh, we had locked it, and then I think uh, we had locked the door, or we didn't lock the door. I forget what happened, but this child broke back into the room, and they had to come and get her again. And again, she was beating me up before they dragged her off because the little nine was behind me and the, the male para couldn't get involved at all. And all he'd do is just keep the other children to the side. And so I had to be the buffer between those two little girls. And I had to write an incident report afterwards. The parents came up. And I was like, this is not how I thought teaching was going to And there are other battles that I learned substitute teachers go through. You know, most of the teachers, most of, most of the vacancies that come up are for teachers who are burnt out. So when you show up to a class, more than likely that class has a lot of out control kids. So you end up substituting in an undisciplined, out of control class. They don't respect the authority that has been with them throughout the year. And so then you show up, show up and they just see you as, it's fun time, it's free time. So I spend the first 15 to 20 minutes of every class, and I'll have five to six periods of classes, just trying to control them. Just trying to get them in their seats. Just trying to get them to listen to me. Uh, just trying to establish my authority in the class. And I'll have some children who will listen and some children who won't, won't, and then half of the class decides, ah, later for you, and the other class, part of the class, you know, they decide, I'm just going to take out my cell phone and do whatever I want to do. You ain't my teacher. So I'm in a battle. I, <laughs> I said, Lord, I didn't envision this. <laughs> and then there's another thing that happens with being a, you never know what you're going to get. When I first started out, I was getting the lower grades. So I was bringing in lessons for the lower grades. Then I'd show up and they'd say, oh, you have AP math today. Four class, four periods of it. Seventh, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade math. Well, all I brought was drawings and <laughs> verbs, you know, and uh, uh, crossword puzzles. <laughs> I didn't come prepared for eighth grade math, quadratic equations and all that. I was like, what? So I sit there looking at them. Now they can control themselves, but they're like, so what you going to do? <laughs> and I'm like, I, 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 I. <laughs> So I'm constantly having to think on my feet, and it's hit and miss. And of course, when, a, when a, an adult, an authoritative adult is in front of you and she does not know what she's doing, the kids are going to do what? They're going to act out. So, but I was told, do not call the principal. <laughs> do not call the principal. The principal don't want to know. She don't want to know. They put you in that class, and they expect you to control it, to manage it, regardless of your skill level or your experience. I've only been doing this for three weeks. So I feel beat up. <laughs> and I, I tell you, after that incident with Lala, I was like, Lord, I don't know. I don't know. What I envisioned 
is different from my reality. How many of you have gone through that? You started out with something, and it was nothing like your reality. And that's where I'm at. So I started feeling discouraged. So then it was time for me to do this message today. <laughs> Ephesians 6.10 says, commands us to be strong in the Lord. And it says that it's giving us, God is giving us strength that we need. And the Apostle Paul is saying here, get ready for battle. Get ready to protect your stuff or take back your stuff by putting on the full armor of God. Now, we can begin to reason in our head, no, I need to do A, B, C, and D. And the last thing we may think is, I need to pray. Because we start thinking, I need to work this out in our own flesh. Now, there are some practical things I could probably do. You know, um, I could contact some of the more uh, experienced teachers and parents in, in the church and say, okay, what do I do with kids that are all over the place? How do I get them in control? How do I be cr more creative? What, what's a no prep lesson that I could do that I could just come off the fly? I could learn a, 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 whole, a whole slew of those things, but it will take time. In the meantime, while I'm learning on the job, what do I do to control these out of control children? Now mind you, some of them are going through separation anxiety. You have any of you, if any of you have Time Warner Cable, there is a commercial on there that's so, so much a picture of my life. And they put on this commercial, um, and the mom is an African American family, the mom's at the door and she says, behave for Uncle Pete. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> And those two little boys on the couch go, what? Yeah, 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 yeah. They're hitting him. They're throwing things at him and all kinds of things. And um, the grandmother calls and says, are you all right? And he's like, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> and then finally he comes with two laptops. Yes. And they calm down. Yes. I did that one day. Because <laughs> we lived that out. And I was like, I, I can't even get them to, to sit and listen. So finally I said, where's the laptops? Where's the laptops? <laughs> oh my God. And with the eighth graders, when they, were, when they were going crazy on me, I said, pull out your cell phone. Just pull out your cell phone. You can do whatever you want. Pull out your cell phone because I could not control them. So um, this is not what I envisioned, everybody. When I, dreamed of teaching. I thought I'd have a nice little group of pe little people who would be well behaved and, and you know, they'd have responsive parents and, and, and we'd have a curriculum and every week we would go through the curriculum and then they'd take the assessment test and the only problem would be for them to, to be ready for the assessment test. That would be the only problem I'd have to deal with. No way! <laughs> that's not even in, that's like I can't even get to that. I had to just, the assessment is, can I get them to sit in their seat? Forget about the assessment test. Can I just get them to sit in their seat? Okay. <laughs> I have to see this as an attack from the enemy. Because I love to teach. That's one of my passions. I love people. I love these little kids. But the thing that I want to do, I'm unable to do because of the circumstances that I've been put in. This is war zone teaching. It is, when, whenever I get my first check, it will be combat pay. <laughs> and then we're in this series led by the Lord on putting on the armor of God. Know this, that the enemy has a strategy 
a personalized plan of attack against us. And he uses different baits for different people because he knows we're all uniquely made. And you see, he carefully considers your situation. And he takes into account your weaknesses and your strengths, your interests and your tendencies, your history and your past abuses. And with this knowledge, he designs a specific strategy to defeat you. How many times have you said in your life, why does this always keep happening to me? Yeah. It's because the enemy knows what will hurt you or hinder you. And he keeps recycling hurtful people and hurtful situations in your life because he knows what will cause you to doubt God. <laughs> so the first thing you're going to do when you realize that you are under attack is don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie. Because what's happening to you is part of a plan of destruction. And he wants you to get down in the dumps, to be despairing and depressed. But see your trying circumstance for what it is. Incoming warfare. Notice where he often hurts you, because this is where he's going to target you. So expect it, so, because he's not original. Don't get mad at just the person or the circumstances. God is saying, get prepared for battle against your real enemy. Start by refusing him any more room in your mind, your body, your home, and your relationships. Make him dead on arrival. <laughs> For instance, i got to say, these kids are not my enemy. This administration is not my enemy. No matter what I see, the lack of resources, the stupidity, the confusion, the parents are not my enemy, the kids are not my enemy, None of these people are, none of this is the enemy. The enemy is that the enemy, the real enemy behind it, behind it all, wants me to not teach. This is an area I'm called to do. But I am being attacked in it. So that I want to give it up. I want to quit. Anytime you want to quit, that is discouragement. And where does discouragement come from? Exactly. When you know you have the ability to do something and all this mess keeps coming at you until you want to walk away from it, that is a pit plan. Pit plan. But you won't know it as long as you keep thinking it's just stuff that happens. If you just think, oh, it's that crazy person. I can say it's just these crazy kids. No, 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 no. Because not all kids are crazy. There's a way to reach everybody, even the crazy kids. But the enemy wants me to give up. He wants me to say it's impossible. It's impossible. It can't be done. They can't be reached. It'll never happen. It's impossible. But when we start to pray, we peek the devil's plan. The devil can be defeated. There are two things that he does to attack you. Two things he does to attack you. He's not original, but you have to be on alert. Here are the two things he does to attack you. Where are you mightily used by God? That's your area of greatest strength. That's the area he's going to attack you. Where area are you most out of control? That's your area of greatest weakness. That's where he's going to attack you. He's either going to attack you in your strength, or he's going to attack you in your weakness. The enemy hates your strength. This is the area you've been gifted by God for impact. 
an influence, and he wants to take you down because you're a threat. And then he also loves to play on your weakness. This is the area where you feel most vulnerable in, where you feel most out of control. You're easily triggered. It's your Achilles heel. And this is the area he loves to touch so that when you trigger into that behavior, you feel so condemned and so worthless and so hopeless. And your faith in God and, your, and his ability to transform your life is at its weakest. We have beautiful, gifted people in this church. The worship team. You guys are always under attack. And every single time you're under attack, you feel like, I can't stand in front of the people and sing. Right? I'm not worthy. If they knew what was going on in my head, while I'm singing the praises of the Lord, yes, yes. I shouldn't be up here. Guys, he's not original. Wake up! Wake up in the love of Jesus. Wake up and see the plan of the enemy. So when these thoughts come to you, it's incoming warfare. It's because you're a threat. Ramona, you're a threat. Mauricio, you're a threat. The teachers, you're a threat. The ushers, you're a threat. Mary, you're a threat. Jade, you're a threat. You're a threat. You're a threat, honey. That's why. He say, why? It's because you're a wreck. A threat. And he wants to take all, all who you are to the glory of the Lord. He wants to take you down. But you got to open your eyes. Last week, Pastor Benny talked about you got to have vision. The vision is so that you can see that there are more for us than are against us. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Be alert. Sorry to shout at you. <laughs> so anticipate the, the enemy to hit you in your area of greatest influence and your area of greatest weakness. <coughs> How are we on time? Oh, okay. I'm going to go through it very, very quickly. We have a lot. There's a lot in this series. 